Hello and welcome to Timing is Everything, a show of Care Dimensions, formerly Hospice of the North Shore and Greater Boston. My name is Mary Crow, the Education Specialist at Care Dimensions. Today's program is about child life specialists and the Bertillon Center for Grief and Healing. Today's guests are Kristen Goodhue, she is the Children's Program Coordinator, and Nate Lamkin, who is the Director of Bereavement Services and Program Development. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be back. Thank you. So, Kristen, why don't we start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at Care Dimensions. So I'm the Children's Program Coordinator there. I'm also a certified child life specialist. I've been with Care Dimensions since January of 2015, and with uh, Care Dimensions I work with both the pediatric patients on hospice as well as the children of adult patients. And we help them deal with challenging events if they're coming on hospice or if they have a member in their family who's on hospice and at end of life, we work with them to help understand kind of what that's like. Great. Yeah. And Nate? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm a social worker by training, and I've been uh, at Care Dimensions for a little over five years, and I've been doing uh, work in various hospice and palliative care and oncology settings for about 16 years. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Excellent. So, Christian, tell it, Kristen, tell us about child life specialists. So, child life specialists are certified professionals. Um, most of them are trained at the master's level, and we're trained in helping children and families deal with challenging events. So, most commonly, medical events, whether it's a new diagnosis, hospitalization, challenging procedure, um, or alternatively, you know, helping them cope with a parent who's going through this or a grandparent. Um, so there's child life specialists work in a variety of different settings, most commonly children's hospitals, okay. um, but now we're expanding to different alternative settings such as hospice. Excellent, excellent. So tell us more about what child life specialists actually do. So we use a lot of play. Um, we use play to help kids kind of express themselves, to learn. Um, we educate the family based on child development. Um, and you know, really work with the whole family as the unit to help help the child with whatever they're going through, whatever that challenging event is. Um, but most commonly, we do that through play. Wow. So, so that sounds again like you know, children really grieve differently. Is that yes. true? Yes. Yes. So, Nate, talk to us more about this. So, how how do children grieve differently from adults? Uh, you know, it, it certainly, and 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 I would defer to Kristen's expertise on this, but. Uh, it depends on the age and developmental stage, but certainly younger children, you know, through early adolescence, um, their understanding of illness and, and loss and death and the finality of death is, is going to vary. Um, but also the, the burdens that kids carry with them are a little bit different. Um, you know, one of my best friends from college is a pediatric neuro-oncologist. And people say to him all the time, you know, I don't know how you do this. It must be so depressing to be around these sick kids. And it is. But on the other hand, he said, you know, with the exception of kids who are getting treatments with lots of toxic side effects, they sit there with the chemo needle in their arm and they're playing video games and then they get up and they want to bounce a ball. And there's a lightness about it because fundamentally, if, if kids are in an environment where they feel safe and taken care of and their needs are met, they're, they're going to do okay, whereas an adult patient in the same situation is carrying the burden of what's going to happen to my family and my job and my responsibilities. And that's similar for, for grieving folks as well. You know, somebody whose spouse or partner dies, they're adjusting to all new roles and there's changes in the income in the family and there's that heaviness. But nine times out of ten, the kids in the home, again, if they're in an environment where they feel safe and, and supported and comfortable, they're remarkably resilient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, when we talk about grief, you know, we, we, we usually talk about being able to verbalize grief, but you're mm -hmm. talking about play, Kristen. Yeah. So talk more about that, because, you know, some people can look at a child playing mm -hmm. during a a situation where one's grieving and think that that's odd when yes. in fact it isn't. Exactly and we do get a lot of um, parents who wonder is my child grieving, do they understand what's happening, they're playing, they seem to be okay, um, but children learn through play. 
they learn what's going on. They oftentimes will act out any misconceptions through play. Um, they learn about feelings and express themselves through play. So we always say if they're playing, that's a really good thing. That means they're figuring out what's happening. Yeah. Um, and that's their baseline. You know, adults, their baseline is different. Kids, their baseline is play. And so when they return to that, that's a really good thing. Yeah. So, yeah, you really can find out a lot about what a child's yes. going through with that. Also, with, with art, too. Yes. Is that right? Yeah, we use a lot of different self-expression activities activities, art, music, um, it really depends on the child and the child's interests. Yeah. Can you think of like an example in terms of like different forms that you've used like that where you have seen, you know, some amazing results, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, for one example in a children's group, we had um, the kids trace their bodies and color mm -hmm. their bodies in um, with the different feelings. So they might use blue where they're feeling sad, red where they're feeling angry. Um, and I remember one kid just colored their whole stomach in red. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, you know, I feel it in my stomach, I feel it in my stomach. Um, and that's really where he was expressing his anger, was yeah. his belly was hurting all the time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, kids aren't able to just say, uh, my belly hurts because I'm angry because mommy died. Right. You know, it's, so it's really working with them to connect the dots and find the words for that. You know, and, and you're talking about two different things, too, in terms of the child themselves is ill mm -hmm. or yes. they have a sick loved one. Right. You know, and, you know, it's it seems like it's so unnatural, doesn't it? That, mm -hmm. again, when you think about a child, when people think, again, we've talked about this, Nate, when people think about hospice, you know, we, I think we tend to gravitate thinking that it has to do with adults. Mm -hmm. But, you know, children, you know, death or advanced illness is not a respecter of age. And how does that factor in? Because it just feels unnatural. Yeah, and I, I think it definitely is. I think it's it's really difficult for the parents and the adults in the situation to see their child going through this. And I think for the child, it's giving them the tools to understand what's happening to their body um, as much as they want to know. Um, I think some kids want to know more than others, but if they're asking questions, it's because they want to know and giving them the information and choices where, they're, can, where they can have choices. Yeah. You also talked about, again, I want to go back to your example of the child who, who was saying that, you know, pain, mm -hmm. the stomach being yep. red and all. Tell us ways, again, that you can often see grief manifested in a child because, again, you know, there's certainly those physical things and, yes. and other ways that you can see grief come out. Yeah. Talk more about that if you would. Some kids regress. Um, some kids will, you know, if they're potty training, they might start wetting their pants or sucking their thumb, um, you know, acting out at school if their grades are dropping or they're getting into fights, trouble sleeping, um, whether they're eating more, eating less, all kind of through their behaviors. Yeah. So talk more about, too, so as child life specialists, what other things do you offer in terms of helping kids, uh, mm -hmm. again, to, to work through their grief in this way? So we offer to see kids individually, um, either in their home or at our office. Um, typically, we suggest in the home because that's where the child is the most comfortable. Yeah. Um, and we can work with them individually, whether it's a sibling group or just one sibling at a time. We also offer children's groups. Um, so we have a family night coming up, both in the North Shore and um, in Dedham, where families who are grieving the loss can come together and meet other families in their community. And then we also have our Camp Stepping Stones this summer. Yeah, you know, and, and we're going to talk more about Camp Stepping Stones, you know, certainly uh, throughout the program. So, um, you know, if you want to just, you know, tell a little bit about that, we'll certainly go into more detail on this too. So Camp Stepping Stones is a one-day um, camp for families on July 16th, and it's for any families, whether they're on, um, you know, they had someone on Care Dimension Services or in the community, or they live on a state, um, and they come together for this one-day event, and we have games, um, self-expression activities, different events for the adults as well. That's great. Um, yeah. And like I said, let's let's talk more about this too, but I want to ask you, just going back to child life specialists for a minute, let's talk about, so when do you call a child life specialist in? So you can really, I mean, you can contact us whenever. Um, if you, if your child is asking questions you're not sure how to answer um, and you just want, you know, some additional guidance over the phone, mm -hmm. if your child is exhibiting some of these behaviors, you know, where they're having trouble sleeping, they're acting out in school, that would be a good time to call us. Yeah. Um, or, you know, if you just, you know, a parent knows their child best and if yeah. they see that the child is acting off, um, then give us a call and, you know, we can provide a, a home visit or 
a phone consultation. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that, you know, what sometimes, you know, grief feels like such an isolating event, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. And people feel like they're kind of out there alone holding that grief bag. You know, I, I, you, the, what you're talking about is so important, isn't it? And, and you know, so, something that Kristen said that, that that's so important, and, and I think that she and uh, our child life specialist in the Boston area, Danielle Buzanga, do so well, is they create a partnership with the parents. I mean, mm -hmm. parents can be a little apprehensive about having a clinician come and, you know, what are you going to say to my child? And, you know, Kristen and Danielle always lead with, you know, you're the expert on your child. You know, we, we bring expertise in child development and we see lots of kids at all different ages so we can talk to you about themes and, and patterns of behavior that we see and, and we can help you understand some of what your child might be saying. But at the end of the day, yeah. you're the expert on your child. Right. Um, and, and that sort of disarms people and their defenses go down and they say, okay, they're not going to come in here and start telling me what's what with yeah. my kid. Well, and, and I think that it, that approach is wonderful because nobody knows themselves or their loved one as well as they do, mm -hmm. you know, so I think it can be threatening and it sounds like, again, you, you go out of your way to make sure that this is a partnership and feeling like, again, it's an additional resource to help people through this. Right. And, and while Kristen and Danielle are always happy to work directly with the children, even in situations where that's not what the parents want, um, you know, they can do some coaching with the parents and just help them develop a language to speak with their child. Great. So we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back to talk more about this. I have worked in a lot of different settings and I, I have never seen the care, love and support that I've experienced um, with Care Dimensions. Because it's about the patient's quality of life. We provide care during one of the most challenging times in a family's life. One of the things that we really focus on is how people want to live their life. We have transformed the way our community experiences end-of-life care. It is more than hospice. It is care for advanced illness. At Care Dimensions, we'll take care of your family like you're a part of ours. Welcome back to Timing is Everything. I'm Mary Crow, and this is Nate Lampkin and Kristen Goodhue. We're talking today about child life specialists and also about bereavement uh, support at the Bertillon Center for Grief and Healing. And, you know, we, thank you so much, you guys. Well, what great information you provided uh, earlier on in this segment. I want to talk more about, let's get back to camp now, mm -hmm. Kristen, because this sounds, it's just wonderful. Yes. Um, and, you know, Talk more about it. Talk more about Camp Stepping Stones. So Camp Stepping Stones, I think a lot of kids when they hear, you know, this is a camp for grieving children, they get a little worried and apprehensive thinking, you know, are we going to sit around and talk all day about the person who died? I don't want to go to a camp where I'm going to feel sad all day. Um, but it is a lot of fun and kids afterwards, you know, will realize that they want to come back year after year and they meet some really good friends. Um, so the programming starts at age four. But we offer children, you know, younger than that to come and we'll provide child care for them. Um, and the programming goes up until age 18. So kids, you know, over the whole age spectrum are welcome to join. And we do different programming based on age. So the teens will have their own separate programming. Um, this year we're going to have a rock wall and a photo booth. So hopefully we'll, you know, get some teens really interested in that and oh, I think it great. should be good for them. That's excellent. Well, again, an important factor that you're bringing in is about different ages right. because again developmentally you're going to see mm -hmm. children grieve differently and need different things exactly so it's nice that you break them down into groups like that mm -hmm. so um, other things that you want to talk about in terms of camp stepping stones right now you know I think for kids it's a really good opportunity for them to meet other kids going through yeah. something similar like yeah. you said grief is so isolating especially for kids who lose a parent or a sibling um, you know it's not common and so they often feel like they're the only ones yeah. so to put them in a group of other kids their age who also lost someone like that yeah. um, can be very comforting for them absolutely you know and and I do I think that again they go back to their school system the thing and not everybody's going through that but when right. they're at this camp surrounded by other children who have endured a lot even though people's loss is so individualized mm -hmm. they're still with others that have gone through you know different losses as well so isn't right. it nice to be able to connect in that way mm -hmm. you know and then it, it just reminds me of again you know grief shared is grief diminished right That's so right. it's just so important that people are able to connect in this way yes. yeah. yeah this is our, our 15th <coughs> excuse me our 15th year of offering camp stepping stones and it, it's 
yeah, seems to sort of grow steadily every year. Uh, some of our viewers might be familiar with Camp Stepping Stones, and until this year, we've done it as two partial days. It used to be on a Saturday and a Sunday from you know, 9 to 3. Um, but we're trying a new one longer day format here. It's going to go from 10 in the morning to 7 at night. It's on Saturday, July 16th. Um, and we're, we're thinking that given how summer weekends are so precious, that uh, you know, being able to have a robust camp experience, but you, know, you have your Sunday to relax or unwind or do other things, we think that's going to be attractive to people. And I, I do want to make sure to point out that although camp is held on the campus of the Glen Urquhart School in Beverly Farms, yeah. it is open to anyone throughout the Boston area. As Kristen said, we've had people come from southern New Hampshire and Connecticut. And if you don't live on the North Shore and transportation to camp is going to be challenging for you, um, we'll help you get there. We'll, we'll provide transportation. So. We really, and our, our focus has been the last couple of years on making sure people in Boston and Metro West and south of the city you know, understand that camp can be for them too. Excellent. Yeah, because again, wanting to make sure that people are aware of, of who, this, who you're actually reaching out to here. Mm -hmm. So people don't have to be on service. No, certainly not. And, and in fact, all of the services that we provide, um, child life, the grief counseling, our groups, workshops, camp, those are all open to anyone in the community who is experiencing illness and loss. And, and in fact, the Child Life Program specifically, although it, it sort of falls under the bereavement department, um, you know, Kristen and Danielle can do some short-term consultation for people in the community who are, are not connected with hospice. In fact, the first exposure that I had to child life in hospice care was with Kristen's predecessor and this was, you know, about eight or nine years ago when I was at Dana Farber, uh -huh. and you know, I might be working with a newly diagnosed patient in her 30s, and you know, she and her husband have two school-age kids, mm -hmm. and they're saying to me as the oncology social worker, "How do I talk to my kids about this?" Sure. And it was such a great resource to be able to say, you know, you can call. I mean, we were then Hospice of the North Shore, but uh, you just call this person up and the feedback that I would get from these parents when I saw them afterwards was just overwhelmingly positive. There's so much apprehension. I mean, whether you're talking about illness or dying or death, parents imagine what that's going to feel like to how do I look my six-year-old daughter in the eye and tell her mommy's dying. And, you know, Kristen or Danielle would talk it through with them. And nine times out of ten, they sit down and have the conversation. And then when there's follow-up, typically the response from the parents is that went so much better than I yeah. thought it was going yeah. to. Thank you. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. I know you, we, we tend to want to think we're, we're protecting kids from mm -hmm. this, but unfortunately we can't protect right. them from this type of thing in life, right? So I, I, what I love hearing from both of you is that how do we talk openly about this mm -hmm. so that we can help people through this journey, you know, in the, in the healthiest way possible, because mm -hmm. this right. is heavy stuff, yeah. you know? So Tell us, Nate, talk more about the, you, you, the Bertillon Center for Grief and Healing. Tell us a little bit more about that and also the services that's provided. Sure. So the, the Bertillon Center for Grief and Healing is uh, essentially a wing of the Kaplan Family Hospice House in Danvers. And we provide one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling, uh, support groups, workshops, various programs at that physical location. We do also see clients and, and provide groups and workshops down in Greater Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, our office is down in that area is currently in Wellesley, but we've been in that office for about five years and we've grown substantially mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to be moving to some uh, new space, larger space in Waltham. Uh, and that's going to coincide with the second hospice facility that we're going to be building uh, in Lincoln, right on the Lincoln-Waltham line. Uh -huh. um, so that's very exciting. But uh, yeah, it's, it's important for people to know that you don't have to have had a loved one on hospice to get grief support from us. And um, we, you know, our, most of our services are at no cost. Yeah. Uh, nearly all of the groups and workshops we don't charge for. There are occasionally some things like camp. We charge a, a nominal $25 registration fee. And occasionally we have workshops where we're 
renting space somewhere else or we're using suppl art supplies and things. So we might charge a modest cost, but um, no one is ever turned away because they can't pay. And if the $25 fee for camp, for example, is challenging, um, just let us know what you think you can pay. And last summer we had a homeless family come um, and we got the, the transportation. That was overnight last year, so we put them up in a hotel and wow. you know, we, we're never gonna turn anybody away because the payment is an issue. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. So you're really making this so accessible to, so, to all people. Mm -hmm. So that's wonderful. So what other kinds of, so give us some examples of some so support group, support services mm -hmm. that you would offer through the Bertillon Center. So the majority of our support groups are loss specific. Mm -hmm. you know, for example, we have loss of spouse partner, adult loss of a parent, loss of a child. And because we're, we're for a, a bereavement program in hospice, so robustly staffed and resourced, we're able to deliver that kind of specificity. That's not to say that people with different kinds of losses can't find common ground, but the work that's done in a support group is so relational mm -hmm. that you know, the more people have in common, the more quickly the group gels and you know the needs of somebody who is coping with the death of a spouse are going to be different than somebody who's lost a sibling or a parent. Yeah. Um, most of the groups are eight-week closed groups meaning that people register in advance mm -hmm. and then the same group of people meet once a week for eight weeks so that you know relationships can develop and you can do some some deeper dives into the topics. Yeah. But we do also offer one-time workshops. Um, um, one of them that we offer regularly is called Newly Bereaved mm -hmm. for people who the loss is so new that maybe going into an eight-week support group would be a little overwhelming, but it gives them a chance to 